Are you ready, Hoddle? I'm ready. We're recording. I was born ready, bro. All right, man. Good to see you. I'm, uh, I'm watching my baby, so if I hey. have to split for five minutes. Okay. We'll let you go. You, uh, Preston, how you doing, man? Doing great. Great to be here, Peter. Thank you both for coming on. We've got a lot to get through. I'm using my standing desk for the first time today. I thought I'd do an interview standing. Look how trendy you are, man. Trendy? I've got fucking... you got a standing desk. Are you drinking a hemp milk latte? I've got a glass of wine, dude. <laughs> Celebrated. No, I put my back out. I had to get this new desk um, so I could stand up a bit more because uh, my car... What the fuck are we talking about? Dude, listen. Tesla, let's let's start. Uh, I've got some financial shit to go through at Preston. You go first, Hoddle. Tell, tell me about your day. Well, okay. First of all, I woke up and I, you know, it's like 5 a.m. I immediately check my phone. I see Elon. I like go like this. I'm like, oh, ah, Elon. I started screaming. I scare my dog. Everybody in the house is like, what's going on? Like, I have never woken up quite this bullish before. And I had to explain to my wife what was going on. I was like, this is the first domino. This is the first domino. Like, all the dominoes are set to fall after this one. Like, I can't, I can't, you know, contain the bullish feeling I have inside. Like, I have, I wanted to, like, I want, I want to open my window and just scream at my neighbors and be like, I'm bullish as hell. I, you know, I'm so bullish right now. <laughs> it was amazing. It was a great morning for me. Good man. Preston, tell me about your day, dude. You know, it's pretty exciting when you have the world's richest person who runs a monster tech firm that's known for breaking all precedents in, in technology, uh, stack 1.5 billion on his uh, balance sheet. So, I think from a narrative standpoint, I think it's going to, uh, if it wasn't a talking point in the boardrooms before, it's definitely a talking point in in boardrooms right now. And um, I think as we look to the price move that I'm kind of anticipating from now into like April, which I think it's going to be fairly unprecedented, how much Bitcoin's going to move in in such a short amount of time, I think it's only going to compound the talking point of what it is that they just did. Yeah, so I was, it's afternoon for me, so I was uh, watching this Britney Spears documentary the New York Times just did. And uh, You hey, too? No, no. You too? You no, know, well, no, we're because we're making, on the Defiance, we, we started work on a show about Britney Spears about three months ago, and then they announced theirs. So we, I was watching it, and I get tagged in a tweet, and it comes up on my phone, and it was something like, oh, Pete, you can buy your Tesla now. So I click on it, and I see a CNBC article. I thought it was a joke. So I'm checking the URL and I'm like, no, this is a fucking joke. Obviously, it's not a joke and we've had a wild day ever. But no, I'm with you, Preston. Like, it's now it's a little bit like when people were having Bitcoin on their balance sheet before, it's a little bit like, you know, a bit risky, a bit embarrassing. Now, not to have Bitcoin on your balance sheet is going to be slightly embarrassing. Really embarrassing, especially if the price runs like we expect it to. Um, If you don't understand it, which I think most people just don't, they're looking at it and they're saying... This is emotional. These people are all going to get wrecked and they don't understand that it's actually mathematical. And the thing that's driving it right now is a total supply suffocation of coins that was supplied last May at the halving event. And um, until people do the hard work of trying to understand what that means, they're going to continue to look at it in, in, on a linear chart and say, that doesn't make any sense. But if they, take, if they zoom out and they look at it on a log chart, that what they're seeing is very normal. There's nothing that's abnormal about this. Uh, and you, in, in my opinion, you're, you're not even at the tip of the iceberg on this move right now. I'll tell you something else that's uh, stu- stu- uh, stuck up for me recently. Um, I'll let you go in on this one as well, Hoddle. But, uh, so I, I brought this up on Clubhouse earlier. Everything the Sailor's done has been pretty fucking amazing, right? Like, really, he's been one of the big drivers for a lot of the narrative this year. But the most important thing I think he's done recently, actually, is the two $10 million buys he's done. It's not the big buys. These $10 million buys where he's kind of made the point, it's like, we're not done. You know, they're essentially stacking sats. And then I go and read the, uh, uh, I think actually Plan B put it out. And I go and read what he said about, uh, what they said in the filing. And they said, I've got it here. Uh, they, uh, being, they might begin accepting Bitcoin as a form of payment for our products, which we may or may not liquidate upon receipt. And I think we're approaching that point now, like people aren't going to want to sell their Bitcoin. Well, exactly. So this is a perfect example of what I've talked about for more than a year now about how important free cash flows are going to be for businesses. 
So whether the company accepts Bitcoin or not really doesn't matter because if you're Michael Saylor, every, every dollar that comes through his door, he understands how much of that's going to turn into free cash flow. So let's just say the number's 10%. I don't know what his margins are, but let's just say they're 10%. So for every dollar that comes through the door, his accounting department is taking 10% of that, 10 cents, and turning it into Bitcoin. The rest are going to be paid out in fiat-denominated expenses until they're not. <laughs> and and uh, that's just what he's doing. So whether he's accepting it at, at checkout or not, I just don't really think it matters because these companies that understand what in the world's happening they're saying, hey, whatever free cash flows I got that are getting banked onto my balance sheet, I want it in Bitcoin, right? That's, that's the play. It's the, new, it's the new share buyback. And the sooner the companies figure that out, the faster they're going to realize that they can protect themselves from what's about to happen. Hold on, what do you think this is going to mean for the narrative now? Well, I, you know, I said this on, uh, on Clubhouse. Look at us, just a bunch of influencers hanging out on Clubhouse all day. No, but I said this on Clubhouse earlier. Um, and I think this is the profound takeaway from today's announcement and why I think it's the first big domino to fall is that today the world got a little less short Bitcoin because once you add Bitcoin into the S&P 500, suddenly there is a tremendous amount of the world that now indirectly owns Bitcoin. That's why it's so bullish. Well, the other the other important thing, Preston, you probably want to chime in on this, but I think what what's happened here is Elon Musk and Tesla have added to that regulatory moat around Bitcoin now in that Elon has a lot of influence. I mean, we saw that with him moving, moving out from uh, California to Texas. You know, he's got a lot of influence. And I think now it creates a bigger problem for any regulators that want to bring in some kind of draconian rules around Bitcoin. No doubt about it. I mean, I, I, at this point, you have so much entrenchment on the corporate balance sheets. And can you imagine what the entrenchment is on the private side? Who, who in the world's talking about buying Bitcoin if you're a private company? I know, I'm sure not, right? If, if you're one of these people that are trying to stack a lot or you're a large private company, right? Um, that's something that I, I think is also not talked about. Um, like Ross is a perfect example from the micro strategy. Like here's a guy that pretty much nobody even knew of who's got probably a $5 billion position or whatever. I know he's, he said the big number where he's going to be by the end of the year, but here's a guy who's got billions in Bitcoin and no one even knew who he was, right? So how many more of those people are out there? Uh, how many of those types of people own private companies and are just trying to put as much on their balance sheet as possible, let alone the publicly traded companies that are, that are stacking it on their balance sheet? Um, I, I tweeted today, I think it's the shot heard around the world. And I really think that it is because of who did it, the company that did it, and him being known for being a tech person, a person who can see where the future is kind of going. And so if you're, if you're sitting on your laurels not doing nothing, I mean, dude, wake up. Well, Tim Cook's going to be looking. Jack Dorsey's probably going to be considering more. Who else? We, we've got no idea. But I think what we're expecting to see now over the next weeks, few months, is other people's people put in their play in um, and i think it's a race right hold it's a race because you know everybody wished they got in when micro strategy did whatever their original purchase was like eleven thousand. then the second one at like 23 and now they're seeing it at 45 it's probably going to go over 50 in the next few days like, and everyone it's a race because if you don't get in at 50 you're going to get in 100 if you don't do it 100 it's going to be 150 totally I've, I've been analogizing analogizing it to a game of musical chairs right it's like there is this global game of musical chairs going on and the music is slowing and the chairs are getting fewer and fewer. And at some point the music stops. And what and happens I'm just that when kid, the music stops? I'm just that kid who's standing next to that chair and not moving to the next one, right? Just waiting to sit down and, and, and clogging up the line. I'm that kid who's sitting in a hundred chairs and uh, <laughs> I'm not letting anybody get to any of them. <laughs> I'm that guy going around the chairs with a microphone asking them about their chair strategy. <laughs> Why are we talking about chairs? You, you need to sell your chairs, folks. I know, right? Everybody sell their chairs for more Bitcoin. Pierre would be mad at us all. No, no, you two are sitting chairs right now. I'm the one stood up here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just be straight now. Jesus, like, what the fuck happened today, Hoddle? Like, I know for you, because you've been shouting at your friends for a long time, right? You've been evangelizing Bitcoin, haven't been listening. Um, I'm the same, man. If you go, if you go, if you go to my Facebook, it's a shrine of 
Bitcoin tweets from about $4,000 all the way to $44,000. I'm kind of scared to do it now because I think they all think I'm a prick because they didn't, you know, they missed out. But we're going to have this unit bias bias issue that's going to be a real issue for people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the shitcoin narratives are, uh, you know, they're they're out there and there's a lot of people who are still YOLOing into shitcoins and Dogecoin to the moon, right? Like Dogecoin to $1. I'm hearing a lot of that. I, I, I listened to a, I sat in a Doge room and listened to the, doge quote unquote investors uh you know talk about their their doge thesis today and i was <laughs> it's just like man you can't help you can't help but feel bad for these people because they don't understand the game that's being played right like they don't understand this is a game of musical chairs like i said and so if you're the kid who goes to you know sit on the floor in the corner like you're not ta- you think maybe you're taking part in the same game but you're not taking part in the same game you know well, you, you went into the corner and you got five more chairs and tried to start a new game and no one else wanted to play. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, yeah you're, that you're, sh- you're saying the trash can is a chair. That's basically what you're doing. <laughs> I was arguing with a guy on Twitter the other day about Dogecoin where he's like basically arguing the fundamentals of Doge being better and then saying, oh, well, you're lucky you got in Bitcoin early. And I was arguing. I think, what the fuck am I wasting my time arguing with somebody about the fundamentals of Doge versus Bitcoin? Yeah, like, That's a conversation that's a waste of time. Let me ask you though, like Preston, I um you know, even this morning I sent out a shitty tweet about uh, Elon Musk. Uh, I, I I had a gif of lemmings where it says paradise, and as they head towards paradise, they're falling into the lava. And I was like, this is uh, when Elon Musk tweets about Doge. Like, should we give him any criticism for this? Because in some ways, like, in some ways it was so obvious now. Like in in retrospect, right? <laughs> Obviously, but in retrospect, it was obvious what he was up to. But I think a lot of people would have bought Dogecoin based on his tweets. Well, and if you do, uh, you didn't pass the intelligence test. <laughs> right? I'm just, I'm just, fair. I am, no fair. No fair. I'm just about, I am about free and open markets. So if you make your investing decisions because some person goes out and says Dogecoin and it turns out to not be a good choice, well, that's your own stupid mistake, right? Like I'm so tired of everyone treating every other, every other person like they don't have personal responsibility for themselves to make decisions. Like that's what this whole thing's about, man, is, is do the hard work, take responsibility for yourself, for every decision you make and move out. Right. If you can't figure it out, well, I'm sorry. You didn't pass the test. This is a test. This, this is a test of critical thinking, right? And if there's one thing we learned, we need people who have authority in the future that have deep critical thinking skills. So you know what? I applaud them. I think it's great because all the people that stepped into this and bought it, the Dogecoin, congratulations, you're going to have less influence in the future because you didn't pass the critical thinking test. I, I love what the point that Preston is making about uh, personal responsibility and, you know, it, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like Bitcoin is, it, it requires extreme personal responsibility and extreme ownership, right? And that is fundamentally a race to the top. It's a race towards heaven. It's a race to better yourself, right? The fiat currency power games that we see playing in our, out in our society, you know, political currency games, basically, which it's like, hey, the money printer is whirring. It, you know, go ahead and send it our direction. Send it to our particular class or group or tribe or sect or religion like we want some of that free money right that's a race to octopi- occupy the victim position because you're, you're making a claim that i'm a bigger victim so therefore i need more of a handout right and that is fundamentally a race to the bottom like take personal responsibility for yourself take ownership over your life and you know here's the thing like hodling sounds corny Hodling starts with loving yourself because you have to you have to escape this trap of nihilism that the world is in and you have to think that you can have a better future and then you have to put aside money for yourself in the future and then believe in yourself and believe in that future right and that's that's what we see like people uh, who are entering the bitcoin economy like they just have so much optimism and hope and like the energy there right it, it's just like so palpable and i think that's uh that's just a growing trend and i love to see it the people that would have bought Dogecoin, how many questions do you think they were asking about the investment thesis for owning it? Like they were just buying it because one person said was, was tweeting about it without any type of information as to why he was tweeting about it. And they just went out and bought it. 
They didn't ask a single solitary question, but yet they're all up in here in, in Clubhouse broadcasting why they own it. So instead of asking questions and being in receive mode, they're in transmit mode. They're in broadcast mode, right? That's not how you invest. That's not how you think about solving a critical problem or a critical, critical thinking around a problem to know how to invest your money. You need to be in receive mode and asking the right questions in order to generate the right investment thesis. So do I feel bad for him? Hell no, I don't feel bad for him. It's, it's a service that's being provided. All these altcoins are a service to Bitcoin. That's a great point, Preston. And like, if people are new to Bitcoin, like, I mean, I, for when I was new to Bitcoin, I shut my mouth for basically like the first three years. And I just listened to people that were smarter than me because there's a lot to understand here. It's incredibly complex. So don't feel like you have to go out and stake your claim and say, you know, this is the way things are. Because honestly, at the beginning, you probably really don't understand the way things are. So sitting and listening and sort of sifting ideas for yourself is absolutely the best investment strategy that you can employ. I did I did kind of the opposite, but as a strategy as well. I I learned in public. I went out and made a podcast and got everybody on and asked all the questions and figured it out in public. And it was quite a shameful process to go through at times, but I did learn a lot. Fuck you learn a, you know, when you when you're in front of everyone getting yelled at for asking dumb questions, you learn a lot quickly. You and me both, Peter. You and me both. Like it, I remember coming into this in, in twenty fifteen, like Hoddle and, and many others. And it was a lot of questions and a lot of the times you you get you look really silly, right? Because you're asking things and there's these really smart people that step in and come off the top rope and put you in your place really fast. But you know what? There's no better teacher than looking like a fool in a bunch of, in front of a bunch of people. So I would encourage people ask questions. Don't get on here and tell me what it is that you know. Ask a question and see how I respond or see how somebody else is, see how somebody else responds and then take it from there. That's how, that's how you can always make somebody look like the fool that they are is not by telling them anything. It's by asking them the question that they can't respond to because you do know maybe what, what the outcome is. And I'm not saying that I have the answers. That's for dang sure, right? I'm saying if you want to really understand something, you ask questions you don't tell. Well, the thing is, when, when you think about it, there's actually a Dogecoin room on Clubhouse itself. It's pretty dumb. Um, but I think a lot of people are looking for some kind of confirmation bias. Um, they want other people to tell them, yeah, no, I've done the same. I'm right, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I went through it. I shitcoined to begin with. Um, got wrecked, learned about it. And uh, I think some people at the start of that cycle that maybe I was at four years ago, Hoddle, oh, I don't know if you shitcoined. Preston, I don't know if you shitcoined, but I went through that process. I, uh, I traded a little bit of Ethereum, just a little bit, but I made a lot of money off of it and I flipped it for Bitcoin. I think it's a natural progress for people because if you think you're going to step into this and understand it from a technical standpoint from the beginning, I mean, come on, give me a break. There's, there's no way somebody's going to really understand all the technical nuances of this, let alone understand the macro economics of what's taking place and what it's trying to solve. Like, good luck. Yeah. And I, I think the thing to, the, you know, like the unit bias thing is an important point that we should hit on while we're on this subject, because people think that Doge is cheap and they're buying a bunch of Doge. And then, you know, it's like buying a lottery ticket. They're saying to themselves, what if Doge one day goes to 40,000 something dollars, right? Which is a crazy thing to think. But like these people are, you know, unsophisticated retail investors. And so that's their lottery ticket, right? But I think the thing to understand is like in the future, Right. If Bitcoin takes over the, the, you know, the entire world, like eats the entire world like we think it's going to. Right. The average net worth will be 70,000 sats, 70,000 sats. Right. So you can go out today and buy, uh, you know, a million sats for four hundred and forty dollars. So that's the way in which you need to think about it. Like you are taking territory on the Bitcoin blockchain like you are getting a piece of ultra scarce real estate. It's like buying Manhattan real estate in 1776 during the foundation uh, you know, of the American economy. Like that's how, that's what this is. That's the opportunity here, you know? It's your score. Your, your sats is your score in this game. Um, and that leads me to another point. And I think it's gonna, a lot about, you know, it's gonna come up against a lot of what you were tweeting about today, Preston. I've mentioned this in some of the interviews recently, but I was, did an interview with uh, Jamie from Heart 8 Mining. And, yeah, we were talking about the fact that whole uh, Bitcoin on the balance sheet and what she's been doing with that. And part of it was uh, uh, loaning it out to get yield. Uh, part of it was like holding it because during tough times they can use it uh, to borrow against because it's pristine collateral. 
the one thing they don't want to do is sell it. And I was like, okay, well, look, my business is like a microcosm of yours. I've got a small amount of Bitcoin on my balance sheet. But in doing that, over the last year, I've increased the capital on the balance sheet by 150%. Now, next year, if I want to grow my business, say I want to launch another podcast, right? I don't have to go and borrow money. I don't have to take in. I mean, I don't have to borrow money off like an institution. I don't have to. Um, I don't have to give away equity. Um, but I can use that Bitcoin. I can leverage that, and I can borrow pounds, and I can grow my business. But the one thing I don't want to do is ever sell that Bitcoin now. Like it, it represents value on the balance sheet, but it's not a value I want to sell. It's a value I just want to use to grow my business. Or at any point I sell my business, hopefully I get to take it with me. But I'm kind of in that zone now. It's like, how do I get through life not selling my Bitcoin, but using it to live the life I want to lead or grow my business how I want to grow it? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and it's going to take some folks some time to figure out the how powerful what you're saying there, and and because they don't necessarily understand how valuable Bitcoin is. When you look at Michael Saylor and the amount that he's purchased. Let's just keep the numbers simple. If he's got a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin on his balance sheet, and it's bigger than that now, but if you lend that out into an over collateralized market, and and that's a really important piece for people to understand because everyone's used to lending and borrowing in the old system where it was all fractional reserve. Bitcoin markets are not like that. Now, some of there might be some companies that are under or under collateralized. You don't want to be dealing with that. You want, if you're doing any type of lending, it's all going to eventually evolve to over collateral, collateralized loans because no one's going to lend their money unless, unless that's the situation. So that is a big change. And not only is that a big change, but the 24-7, 365 aspect of it allows you to liquidate the escrow of whoever is borrowing your, your Bitcoin immediately in an, and it's over collateralized. So your risk is pretty much key management. Well, now you have... Uh, lending that you you control your own keys still, so even that portion of the risk is is taken away. So let's just say today the interest rates on lending Bitcoin are four percent. Well, Michael Saylor in his situation with a billion dollars of Bitcoin is making forty million dollars a year on lending out his Bitcoin in an over collateralized loan environment that trades three hundred sixty five days a year. Last time I checked. His free cash flows on his company for the year was around like 30 to $40 million, right? So now that Bitcoin, that magic internet money that's literally, that you can't even touch is generating the same type of return and the same type of a profit that all of the people that work at his company are doing. And that's going to, it's going to take time for people to wrap their head around how powerful that is. But it's totally insane and mind blowing. And if you don't think that people are going to be lending out their their bitcoins, as more of these lending peer to peer lending platforms that are over collateralized and trade three hundred sixty five days a year, um, as they get as as there's more of them, right? Because I'm not going to just go to one of these platforms. I'm gonna I'm gonna distribute it across maybe five or ten of these platforms. As these get more mature, watch out, watch out, and. If if I if I want to keep going on this, this is where for me the the hyper Bitcoinization scenario um, turns from a qualitative discussion over to a quantitative discussion. Okay, to date the only thing I've really talked about w- with respect to hyper Bitcoinization, which I think the possibilities of that playing out here in the near term future is is a lot higher than people realize. It was mostly based around the discussion of trust and trust eroding and being plowed into Bitcoin. But now it's actually, for me, starting to look like, the, like it's more mathematical. So let me, let me explain what I'm talking about. So for people that want to implement, a lot of this yield that you're seeing that's being harvested in USD terms, like if you, if you have your, your money in a bank account today, you, can, you could tokenize that dollar and collect 10% interest on it right now through these over collateralized markets, through, through lending and people capturing spreads on the long and short end. Okay. So with Bitcoin, if you want to short sell it and do this long, short arbitrage type deal, and let me just give you an example. Like if you went and bought Bitcoin for, uh, $42,000 today, 
you could then step into a June futures contract and sell it for for uh, forty six thousand dollars, and you'd capture roughly a four thousand dollar yield on that over the next four and a half months. Or I'm sorry, you'd you'd capture an eight point four percent return over the next four point five months. Then next month you just do it again, and then you do it again. So the yields that are being captured by somebody that's doing this, and, and that's a risk-free way, like you're selling it long and you're going long and you're going short simultaneously and you're capturing these spreads and you're, then you're doing it every single month with your, with the free cash flows that you're, that you're working with. Okay. So that's how these yields are being captured. The problem, or, well, not the problem if you own Bitcoin, the, uh, the exciting part, if you own Bitcoin with this scenario is for them to borrow the Bitcoin because the only way you can go short is you have to have Bitcoin, like real Bitcoin to go short, right? Well, guess what? They've got to borrow it. So they're, they're coming into the, the borrowing market. They have to over collateralize, or at least they're all going, they're, they're going to have to get there if they're not there right now. They will, because there's going to be no, nobody lending you the Bitcoins unless you're over collateralized. Okay. So they have to over collateralize the money. It doesn't matter what they're bringing to the table. If they're bringing fiat to over collateralize, or they're bringing you know, whatever coin, tokenized coin, it doesn't matter. Because as soon as they step in and they put it in escrow, who's ever working that exchange is going to immediately turn it into Bitcoin for, for the uh, lender's behalf, okay? So now what's happening, because it's over collateralized, let, and I'm just going to use simple numbers so people understand the numbers, right? Two Bitcoin go in, but one Bitcoin comes out to do the, the long, short arbitrage trade. So what does that do to the market when two go in and get locked up and one goes back into the free and open market, well, that's supply suffocation, right? It's the same supply suffocation that we see being provided through the, uh, through, uh, the four year having event. But now it's getting doubled down in the derivatives market because there's this massive spread that traders just want to capture naturally. Well, when volatility and yield and prices go higher, more people want to put on this trade because guess what? They make even more money. They make even more risk-free quote unquote yield by going long and short at the exact same time. So for me, this is a perpetual engine that is, is sucking supply of Bitcoin out of the market. And what I think it's going to do, my opinion on what this is going to, going to mean is this is going to make the interest rates that you're capturing by borrowing, or I'm sorry, lending out your Bitcoin go even higher than the 4% you're seeing today. Maybe it's going to go up to 10%. Maybe it's going to go up to 15%. Hell, it might even go higher than 20%, depending on how high the price goes and how violent the volatility gets and how many people actually start to recognize that if you're implementing a long, short strategy in the market today and you're not doing it with Bitcoin, well, you're out in left field, dude. You're lost in the sauce. Because the yields that you're able to capture with this strategy in Bitcoin are massive, like unprecedented. No one can even understand it. So let me play out the scenario even a little bit more. And I know I'm going really long here, but wh wh what, what, if, what if yields start blowing out to, let's just say 15 or 20%, okay? What, how in the world are you going to sit in the fixed income market making your 1% on your 10-year treasury. Oh my God, the yields are blowing out in, in, the, in the fixed income market in the 10-year treasury. They're at 1.1% instead of 1%, right? And then you're looking over in this Bitcoin market and it's going 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%. 20%. I, I think there's going to be this realization for anybody that spent some time in fixed income saying, hold on a second. Maybe inflation isn't 1%. When I look at it in fiat terms, like I'm being told, maybe this thing over here in this free and open market is actually the real interest rates. It's going to make minds melt in fixed income if what I'm describing plays out. Okay. So then how in the world do you hold those floodgates of all this money that's, that's pent up in fixed income, like a spring that's been so compressed that it's unfathomable to even think about because yields are at 0%, which means they've been bid to kingdom come at $120 trillion and 20 trillion of its negative yielding, right? That's how insane this market's been bid. And you think it's just going to stay there and it, it's not going to be like pulling a pin and unleashing the floodgates. 
get the hell out of here. You're, you're, you're out of your mind, right? Which is only going to make the underlying Bitcoin go higher, which is only going to attract more people into this long, short strategy, which is only going to make the yields go higher. So how does that people, end though? Like how, what's the end game? On okay. That? Is that okay, like, so is it... I'll talk the end game on that. Okay. So yields keep going higher. And then the big narrative is going to be, oh, these yields, uh, what are they going to go to? 50%, right? That's going to be the, that's going to be the talking point. And people are going to say, we got to shut this thing. Down. This is chaos because yields are going to the moon, right? But guess what? When these yields are going up, Everybody in stocks is going to be saying, I probably need to sell some of this and buy Bitcoin and start lending it out. Right. And so now what happens to the, what happens to the capitalization rates on equities? Well, they actually start getting priced back into reality. Instead of them being a PE of 35, maybe they start getting priced at a PE of 10, maybe even five, right? Because if I'm able to capture 20% interest rate in the Bitcoin, and I'm, this is all hypothetical, right? I'm just playing out the scenario the way I kind of see it going down, right? Let's just say I can capture 20% on interest rates by lending out Bitcoin. Would I buy a, a, an equity market, just an S&P 500 or a NASDAQ market, if the PE is five? Probably not. It would have to be lower than five because at a PE of five, that's 20% to own equities. Well, why in the world would I own equities giving me 20% yield when my fixed income by lending out Bitcoin, quote unquote, risk-free is also giving me 20%. That makes no sense. It's a simple math problem. So equ the equities have to start getting below whatever that, if it's 20%, 15%, 10% that you're getting on the borrowing. Once equities start giving you a better return than what you're getting in fixed income, well, then all of a sudden, now it makes more sense to start owning equities instead of lending out your Bitcoins. That's how I see it all kind of playing out. Okay, so like, it's what you're saying here is like Bitcoin is going to force the repricing of everything back into realistic terms. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, there's no other way that this could play out if we actually believe that Bitcoin is going to become global money. This is how it eats everything, right? Like we, I'm not going to say, I'm going to have to tell people here what you told me the other day, but we had a private conversation and you gave me some projections and I was like, well, that's pretty bullish. And I went and told my son and he was like, yeah, that's, that's pretty mental. But, but I didn't know why it would get to that point. Like I thought it could, but I didn't know why. And I guess that's what you're, that's the, this is the catalyst for that. Yes. The catalyst is, and you could do this today. Let me just give you a scenario that's, that's, that you could implement today. Let's say you're a person and you're hearing this conversation and saying, this is all crazy. This guy sounds like a nut job. What I want to do is I just want to keep my money in fiat in dollars, but I want to capture these 10% returns uh, on the yield, right? Well, you can do that. Look at Gemini, for example, you can deposit. And I think where a lot of this is going to go is in banking, you're going to get your paycheck. You're going to have it deposited to something similar to Gemini. And while it's sitting in there, you're going to collect 10% interest on your fiat and you can still pay your fiat denominated expenses for the month out of that account. But as it's sitting there and you're waiting to pay these expenses, you're going to be collecting, I mean, the yield today on USDC or Gemini USD is 10%, right? And those are in markets and, and those probably, those yields are lower than what you could get in a peer-to-peer -peer lending market right? They're higher than that in a peer-to-peer -peer lending market. So when I look at Avanti and what, uh, what's happening over there with Caitlin Long, this is where they're going. They're going to a place where you, a fool will keep their money in Wells Fargo and collect nothing interest rate. What you're going to do is you're going to go to an Avanti, you're going to deposit, you're going to have your paycheck deposited there. And if you want to buy Bitcoin with whatever free cash flows you have, whatever disposable income you have left over, of course, that's what you're going to buy. You're going to buy Bitcoin and then you'll lend it out. And if you have fiat denominated expenses in the meantime, until we get into this scenario that we're describing, you're going to keep your money in some type of USDC coin. You're going to collect your 10% interest and then you're going to pay. It'll be swapped it back into the old legacy system to pay your, your, uh, your fiat bills at the end of the month. I suspect a lot of these companies are going to start accepting these tokens because they want to immediately start collecting the interest upon receipt. 
So what what does this mean for the dollar then, Preston? Because the scenarios you're describing is Bitcoin, like I already consider Bitcoin a prestige, kind of pristine, sorry, uh, piece of collateral, something I never want to get rid of, never want to lose. And any any pounds I own, which are outside of cash flow, like personal or business, out of six week cash flow is going into Bitcoin. And I'm accepting that. And that's that's the life I'm living, right? But like, what what does this actually mean for the dollar? Because if Bitcoin keeps doing this, it keeps, in my mind, it keeps devaluing the dollar, it keeps devaluing the pound. So does this lead to an ultimate destruction of the dollar or the pound? Or is it a repricing? Is this a is this a devaluation? What's going on here? Yeah, it's it's a total meltdown of fiat currency, but it's going to take place in in a it's going to take place at whatever time the market deems necessary. But the all the gears are in motion for it to happen. And when people say, "Oh my god, everyone talking about hyperinflation, they're crazy." Well, no, it is it is hyperinflation. This is the hyperinflation of of every fiat currency when measured in Bitcoin. You know, you could go back and and probably go back to 2012 and what you could buy a Snickers bar for, now you're buying cars with with the same amount in Bitcoin terms. That's hyperinflation. You know, Bitcoin has gone up in dollar terms 200% since inception. And I kind of suspect it's only going to get more aggressive kind of going into the rest of this year. All right. Now, next thing I want to ask you, going back to, there's like I say, there's a lot of companies that are looking at micro strategy and looking at saying, I'm going, especially when he bought $450 million worth. Like, we were all like, hero, but a lot of people are thinking, you're fucking crazy, man. People like Mike Greens and Peter Shears thinking, you've taken $450 million of your treasury and you've put it into Bitcoin. That was a great decision. Yeah, then did his convertible now another $650 million. And again, a lot of com- companies are probably now looking back and going, God, I should have done what he did when he did it. And now Bitcoin's at just about to tag $45,000. So in my head, I'm like, well, who is... Who is going to be the micro strategy of nation states? Who is going to be that first mover where all the other countries go, shit, they did it at $50,000 or $60,000. We should have done it then. And that is a different game changer once a nation state does it. Well, you're already seeing, uh, I just read something before we started recording that the mayor of Miami is trying to do this on the balance sheet of, of their local government. So, do you have a bunch of, I mean, when you think of how the, how it's going down, it starts with the individual, it then moves to the corporations, it then moves to the local governments, and then it starts moving to the nation states. And, you know, does it do it exactly in that order? Maybe not, but for all intents and purposes, that's kind of how I see it materializing moving forward. Um, your, your point earlier about the entrenchment is so valid and I think anybody looking at this saying, hey, we need to ban this or we need to out, is is totally missing how impactful such a decision would be at this point in the game. Because you aren't you are not shutting this down on a global scale. You can shut it down on on, you know, shut down the exchanges of your local country or whatever, but all they're doing is just tripping. And they're tripping in a in a hundred meter dash that's faster, that's gonna come down to who the fastest person is. And let me tell you, there's not a there's not a second chance to to redo the the shotgun start. Hodo, I was just saying to Preston that yeah, you know, I was talking through the point with MicroStrategy. Yeah, you know, when they first did the four fifty million, a lot of companies thinking, "Whoa, that's what are you up to? That's a lot of money to be putting into Bitcoin. That's a bit risky." And that first purchase looks great, and then the convertible note again, like whatever it was, twenty two. I can't remember what the number was, but again, whoa, what is he up to? Looks like a really smart decision now. I'm wondering who is the the micro strategy of nation states because whoever does it, who does it first, like really does it, announces it. You know, maybe they don't announce it, but if they do and they did it at forty thousand, fifty thousand, they've put it. You know, the central banks have bought it, or they put it on the, you know, the, whatever countries. You know, and I'm talking about outside. Let's just forget the fact that Iran and Venezuela and North Korea or whoever's mining it because they've got free energy. I'm talking about legitimate a legitimate use of of it by government and i'm thinking like is it a you know, is it a chile is it a belgium whoever no i don't care who it is but the first one who does it is going to be the envy of all other nation states and then possibly like does it then become like does it then become a war that other countries are saying well they've done it we're too late so we're going to ban it like how does that all play out man there's been a long um sort of held belief 
in Bitcoin that the first central banks to adopt it are going to be the small and irrelevant central banks. And to some degree, that probably is already happening, and we just maybe are not aware of it, right? Um, but I'm, I'm starting to, you know, I've been hearing chatter uh, from, like, I've been hanging out a lot on Clubhouse. People are a lot more free on Clubhouse than they are on Twitter, and high-level people have been willing to tell me things. And so this is all hearsay. Like, I don't know anything. But I've been hearing that there's high-level consideration going on inside the Federal Reserve. And I've been hearing that from sources that are reputable. And so you kind of start to think, is the Federal Reserve going to take a position sooner rather than later in an effort? Like, and it's almost like Bitcoin and the dollar team up together to take down the world's shitcoins. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen, but I'm starting to see something like that happening, right? Like, like for instance, like, you know, all of this Wall Street involvement, uh, you know, major corporation, American corporations like Tesla putting it on the balance sheet, none of this escapes the Fed. They're not stupid. Like, they're thinking about this. We just, we don't know what they're going to do yet. We don't know what their play is. But I think it might surprise a lot of us. Well, if I, I wish we all had their ability to just print dollars and buy Bitcoin, because they could. They could print $10 billion tomorrow and just go and buy you know, $10 billion of Bitcoin. We can't yeah. do that. They can. And they have that ability. Exactly. From a, from a strategic standpoint, you're crazy to not be implementing that right now. For, for every country in the world. Yeah. Because no one's, no one's currency is backed by anything. So if they're not doing that, they're just asleep at the wheel. I mean, because it's like, you know, um, you, you have to put them on. We ha you have to put Bitcoin on your balance sheet in order to stave off speculative attack. You just have to, right? Especially if you're a country that's vulnerable to speculative attack. Like, you know, you could see something like, like a country like Nigeria, right? They, they had a pretty draconian action against Bitcoin because... They're scared of a scenario like that occurring. But I think that, you know, the Nigerian population understands, whether the Nigerian government does or does not understand, that they have no ability to control it. They only have the ability to control their citizens. They can throw their citizens in cages, but they can't stop Bitcoin from permeating their borders. They just can't. It's effervescent. It's omnipresent. Bitcoin is everywhere. But if the Fed does it, isn't that a speculative attack on its own currency? I would say yes, but at the same time, if you know, if you know you're going to be devoured, I think it was uh, Steve Jobs that said you have to cannibalize yourself in Silicon Valley because if you don't, you're going to die. And I see this as being a very similar thing. Like you can continue to hold on to the past and tell yourself that this isn't going to happen, or you can cannibalize yourself and try to have the best positioning that would be possible in this new world that you're moving into. I mean, this is a total tech. Tech is now stepping itself into government money. And if you're not going to play the game and cannibalize yourself, you're, you're going to be very far back from where you used to be as far as the power that you used to wield. This is One a things common... I, go on. Uh, oh, yeah, I was just going to say, this is common bull cycle FUD surrounding Bitcoin that governments are going to ban Bitcoin, right? You heard it. Um, Mike Green versus Nick Carter was a great example of that. You know, Mike, Mike Green went out called Nick Carter basically a terrorist and a criminal. Right. Like, I mean, that was the craziest interview I'd ever heard. And I thought Nick did a tremendous job in that. But you're hearing this governments will ban Bitcoin from everyone all, all across the board. And it's this it's this weird fear reaction that I don't think looks logically at the situation. Governments have rubber stamped Bitcoin, the asset. They have OK. They are OK with Bitcoin as a store of value where the conversation is going to come with regulators is going to be Bitcoin as a network. What, how much censorship resistant are we going to be allowed? What's the cat and mouse game between devs and regulators? How does that play all? That's, that's all TBD. But Bitcoin, the asset, has been rubber stamped by the powers that be, and it's A-OK. -okay. And I would, I would tell you, Bitcoin, the network, is a change in the way that you think about taxes. So this is going to take time for policymakers to come to grips with this. But they're used to being able to look back into the network of how money has, has worked historically and say, hey, right here, this transaction that happened between these two people for this big giant dollar amount, that wasn't kosher, we wanna tax it. And, and what they're gonna have to do is they're gonna have to move to something that's way further down, downstream to sales tax, and you have to focus on sales tax in order to collect the, the proceeds that are needed in order to run whatever form of, and size of government that you wanna do in the future. So they have to change the way that they're gonna think about it. They're not going to want to change the way that they, they've got to think about it. But I would tell you the countries that, have, that adapt 
to that mindset of looking further downstream for the tax revenues and focusing on productive labor and productive goods that are being exported or made domestically, because that's how you can make sales tax. That's where you need to focus your energies if you're going to be competitive into the future. It's not an opinion. It's just me looking at the mechanics of how this works and understanding what you've got to do in order to uh, adjust your positioning to the environment that you're going to be served. Like Mayor Francis in Miami. Uh, by the way, we just tagged 45K, which is very cool. Um, yeah, and another thing that crosses my mind with this, Preston, is like, I don't know how much of Bitcoin is held by Americans, but I'm assuming it's the dominant, dominant yeah, I would country agree. in terms of holding Bitcoin. I think there's I mean, got to be eight, eight, eight to 10 million Bitcoins in America. That's well, what I think. And, and, I think there's I don't a know lot of Bitcoin in America. I don't know if it's 20%, 30%, 40% of Bitcoin held by Americans, but actually for the US government to even consider, I mean, they're not going to ban Bitcoin, but any, any, just say they were, that's actually an e economic attack on America itself. And actually it damages a, an advantageous position that America has itself. So in some ways, if the Fed was to put Bitcoin on a balance sheet, it ma maintains America's dominant position in the world. And it would therefore be interesting to see what something like China does. It will as long as the spending habits of the elected appropriators in Congress understand that the habits of the past have to change drastically as far as how they're, how they're allocating that capital and spending the, the tax receipts. If that, if that mindset doesn't change, and you have this mindset of let's spend everything and get it out the door because it's getting debased at a breakneck pace. If that doesn't change, well, it, it's going to be short lived in Nate in, you know, the, the, the dominance or the, the power that was basically achieved in that changeover is going to be short lived. Yeah. But like, we've all been through this. I mean, I don't know yourselves personally. I don't know Hugh Hoddle personally on this or you Preston, but like I'm historically financially irresponsible. I've always made good money, right? I've always had good jobs and made good money. And I've always blown it, right? I've always just bought stupid shit. I've never been a particularly strong saver until Bitcoin came along, right? And Bitcoin taught me financial responsibility, taught me discipline, uh, mainly because I just don't want to sell my Bitcoin, right? I kind of do because I want to have some fun, but I just can't because, you know, I've, I've been forced into this financial discipline. And then it forced me into financial discipline with my company, and I've never been in a better position with my company and personally. Perhaps this is the lesson we all go through and perhaps this is the lesson and something that will happen, whether it happens firstly at a state level or at a federal level in the US or wherever. But it's that kind of financial responsibility is now going to be enforced upon the officials that govern us at any level. Dude, I mean, well, OK, we were talking about Bitcoin as personal responsibility earlier. And yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is extreme personal responsibility. Here's why. When you incorrectly economically calculate in a Bitcoin system with a hyper scarce asset with a sound money, the Bitcoins go away from you and they don't come back to you because you have incorrectly economically calculated, whether that's through malinvestment, whether that's through trusting the wrong third party, whether that's through your own you know, self-custody solutions like the guy who locked himself out of $220 million. Uh, when you do things that are incorrect, the consequences are dire in a Bitcoin system. And it doesn't work that way in a fiat system. If you do things in a fiat system that are incorrect, you economically calculate incorrectly, you get a bailout, right? The powers that be print more money and they make you whole again. That's not Depends capitalism. Who you are. Bitcoin is, Bitcoin, well, yeah, exactly. Bitcoin is real, true, free market capitalism. And capitalism, guess what, boys and girls? It has winners and losers, right? So yes, you have to become more responsible when you operate with Bitcoin. You just have to be. Otherwise, you will lose Bitcoin. A fool and his money are soon parted. What do you think, Preston? I have nothing think, to add to that. I, I think that was sheer brilliance, Hoddle. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So listen, I'm, gonna, I'm only going to take another 10 minutes of your time because it's late here and I wanted to get a Tesla show out tomorrow. Like, what's next? Because I'm sat here looking at the prize and I'm sat here thinking, who's next? Like, are we going to see, you know, is Jack Dorsey going to come out with Square and say, shit, we've done some more? Or are we going to see... Uh, Apple come out. I mean, look, I I know there's a couple on the sidelines that we're waiting to hear from because people have told me. I know you, Hoddle. You've had people tell you. I don't know about you, Preston, but like, what's next? For me, the thing I'm really watching is this thesis that I've got on interest rates. I think you're going to continue to hear the next big 
tech company. You're going to hear another big brand name person say that they're buying it. And people are going to say that that's what's driving the price up. And sure, it, it, it is driving the price up. But I think the thing that, that I'm looking at that's driving the price up is the supply suffocation. It's a lack of coins being on the market that's driving the price up. The fact that you have these big buyers stepping in is only enhancing that, adding to it. And the thing that I'm, that I'm personally like paying really close attention to is lending rates on Bitcoin. How does that market mature going into the next two quarters? Um, because I, I suspect there's going to be a massive influx of demand for borrowers in Bitcoin that are trying to implement this long short strategy. Um, you know, you, you brought up Mike Green earlier. That's how his fund Logica works. They go long short and they capture a spread. So like the irony for me that he's not in this trade based on these yields that we're seeing is just kind of mind blowing to me. But I think you're going to see more of these guys start stepping into the market to do this risk-free trade that's producing these massive returns. And I think as the demand for borrowing goes up from these types of uh, entities and you combine it with people that are a little leery to lend their Bitcoins because um, they're used to a fractional reserve system and that's not what this is. This is an over collateralized system um, is only going to augment those yields as they go up. And if that's true and those yields keep going up, boy, watch out. Cause I just don't know how you're going to be able to put the genie back in the bottle at that point. Well, that supply shock comes from all angles because you know, it's like hard or I, I mean, I know you're in that. I'm not going to sell my Bitcoin zone now, but three years ago, I bet you're like, mm, if Bitcoin hits this, I might sell a couple. I might sell a few. You know, I think the narratives changed. I probably was more in that zone. And I think over time, as you realize, like just how Bitcoin goes up forever, how it's designed to pump forever, uh, you just go, I'm not going to ever part with this. You become like uh, like uh, Gollum with the ring. You know, at first you're just like, oh, this is a shiny ring. I like it. And then after a while, you're just like, my precious, my pre like, I'll never let this go. Right. I mean, that's how I am with Bitcoin, you know, and I've been hearing the chatter, too, on Clubhouse. I I've had like, you know, well, um, you know, high level sources, you know, people tell me people who are signed to NDAs tell me that many companies that they're aware of are getting in on this. I think uh, Preston was the most prescient with this. I don't think any of us saw the corporate treasury trade coming except for this man right here. Like Preston called this well before everybody, maybe Preston and Andy Edstrom are like the only guys I heard even talk about this, right? And so, you know, even, and, and what's interesting is like even boring companies, like, uh, you know, not Elon Musk, the boring company, but just, co you know, plain, stable, vanilla, boring old companies, they have CFOs that are, they get this and they're getting interested. And some of them have already made large buys and will be disclosing soon. I think like the big thing that we're seeing is there's this sort of three touch phenomenon with Bitcoin that we as individuals experience, right? And so the first touch, you touch Bitcoin, you go, ah, Bitcoin, that sounds stupid. What's that? I don't care. Second touch, you go, huh, Bitcoin, it's still around? All right, interesting. Maybe I'll look into it later, but you don't do anything. Third touch, you go, oh shit, I need some of this Bitcoin. Like, I can't believe it just keeps ripping in my face, right? And I think the world is about to collectively go through its third touch. The gradually, then suddenly part of the cycle, 2013 was the first touch. Bitcoin, huh? Nerd money? I don't get it. 2017 was the second touch. What's this? Crypto kitty? Still seems dumb. I don't know. Maybe I should get some. Who knows? Third touch, 2021. Wait, wait. Elon Musk just put it on the corporate balance sheet. Bitcoin is now part of the S&P 500. What's happening here? Dude, there's a fourth touch because I've been, last six months, I've been through that fourth touch. That fourth touch is like, shit, I need to put everything into this shit that's not enough i need to borrow money and put put money into there shit like i've got a new sponsor like i'll tell you this one thing i've got a new sponsor right um how do i say because i don't want to give sponsor numbers away i told this new sponsor uh, if you pay me in bitcoin uh in advance i'll give you a 10 percent discount that's now at 55 percent you know you get to that place it's like just get me into that bitcoin and look this is a bull market bear markets are going to be very different i could have made the same trade and be down 55 percent but I'm also thinking a lot about, I did this interview with Dan Howard the other day where he talked about the Bitcoin super cycle. And he said, this one might be different. We'll keep looking at the other cycles and we're comparing the charts. But he said, the big difference in this cycle is that people don't want to sell their Bitcoin and there are markets to leverage your Bitcoin. And if we get into that mindset, then, you know, whatever the predictions are, yeah, they could be out the window. Yep. And that's what Preston was talking about earlier. I think we're going to see that. 
Yeah, I mean, who's going to want to sell their Bitcoin if they're making double digit yield by lending it out yeah. <laughs> in an over collateralized, you know, borrower? My my only point on this would be I like for me personally, the risk reward is not right on these on these loan products yet on these lending products. Like I don't think six percent is enough to give up my Bitcoin with all the risk that that entails with that whole speech I went on about economic calculation and how when Bitcoins go away from you, they never come back. If you leave your Bitcoins with a trusted third party, yeah, sure, you can sue them. But guess what? You're getting paid back in dollars. You're not getting paid back in Bitcoin. Just ask the Mt. Gox creditors, you know. So when you look at things like HODL HODL and it's peer to peer and you're keeping your keys, that's why I'm saying it's so important to see how this market matures from the platform, from the lending platforms. And you see Adam back, he's tweeting about using things like HODL HODL. I mean, this, this is maturing really fast. And I think it's, it's probably going to be one of the most aggressive areas is these, uh, and I don't know that I would necessarily call some of them decentralized platforms yet. Uh, at least the ones that you would want to put some trust in, but they're getting there really fast. And the more that you're actually controlling the keys for both sides of that, whether you're borrowing or lending, the more uh, interesting it's going to get by the day. So that's that's where I'm looking at. And I think there's going to be one of the biggest areas of interest in the next six months. Some wild shit. Right, listen, look, going to close out. It's getting late here. It's 11 o'clock. Uh, appreciate both your time at short notice. Man, where do we finish off? I tell you what, hold on, tell me. How's the rest of this year look for you? What do you think is going to happen? Man, um, I think that we are, I think we're going through a phase in Bitcoin's adoption where guys like us are becoming irrelevant. Like, I don't know when the history books get written about this that we'll actually be uh, in there, right? Like, so for me, it kind of looks like fading into the background. Because the big players are coming in, the Elons, you know, the Tim Cooks of the world, Jerome Powell, whatever he ends up doing. And that will be the shit that gets written about when Ron Chernow writes the history of this whole thing. You know what I mean? Maybe maybe Preston Pish and Peter McCormick and American Hoddle are a slight footnote somewhere in one of the pages, right? But like I think a lot of it like we really we really bled for this thing. And, you know, we all everybody in the first decade plus of Bitcoin put a lot of their blood, sweat, tears, and energy into this to make it come to fruition and like I'm so fucking proud of every single person that was a part of it and it was a fucking beautiful thing but like it's coming to the world stage now and it's not our precious little baby anymore like it's growing up Peter McCormack and it's going off to college man and we we just gotta be you know be okay with letting it go and just exp live life to the fullest man and have its own experiences you know you know what you might be right you might be right actually but i think you say that but we're still going to need like we're going to need the michael goldsteins and we're going to need the pierre rochards just like guarding it just a little bit the matt odell's a few of those badasses in there what about you preston how's this year play out dude oh i think it's going to be epic i think it i think the price between now and mid-april is going to be gangbusters way more than people are expecting and then I think you're going to go through some, some natural chop and volatility uh, from there, you know, into the six figures by, you know, the mid, mid uh, summer into the, um, into the fall. So uh, I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. I can't wait to see the CNBC talking heads still not understand it. Um, it's, it's going to be fun because everyone's looking at it and they're saying, what is this thing? This is so... This doesn't make any, the same thing that you've seen with all the people that have been long Tesla and all your traditional folks that were, you know, saying, oh, it's, it's going to die here. It's, it is the same exact lens being applied to Bitcoin, but probably 10 X more so. So it's going to be kind of fun to, to watch how, uh, how this melts some minds here moving into the rest of the year. Well, Dude, listen, if we are just in the footnotes, yeah, go on to Preston, one of my favorite tweets so far was the tweet you put up like six months ago with that ridiculous fucking parabola on it. And it wasn't enough. You didn't draw the line parabolic enough. Like that is the funniest thing to me. And I think that's what we're about to see. Even more of that kind of thing. I redrew it in recently. So I keep adding, I keep adding to that <laughs> August thread and I redrew it. And that's why I'm saying the, the, on the chart now whether this happens or not i have no idea but the but the redraw that i just recently posted i think last week has the price at 95,000 in mid-april before it starts go 
before it starts going into some chop, it'll come back. I have the line coming back down into like the 50,000 range after that, I think into like May or something like that. But, uh, when you start looking at the chop and it's not like I'm doing anything that's like, you know, crystal ball here. Like all I'm doing is just looking at the previous cycle and I'm looking at how many days from the previous having occurred. I'm looking at the percents that, that it was up that many days into the future and just looking at the volatility that we've seen historically on the previous four year cycle and just kind of plotting it out. Like that's all, that's all there is to it. And if, if those numbers materialize themselves, which this cycle has been more aggressive than the last, um, if, if what we saw in the previous cycle happens, well, we should be looking at something like $95,000 Bitcoin in mid April, which that's, that's, sounds that's totally chart. nuts, right? That's the chart you sent me, right? Yeah. 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 But you, you made that chart pre Tesla. <laughs> That's true. You did dude. Oh, I know. It's a game changer. Like we've all got to go to bed and wake up tomorrow and like, see what this actually means. But like, look, it is what it is. If we're in the footnotes, so be it. We'll be in the footnotes sat in Mexico, drinking margaritas. at Satoshi's round table talking shit to each other. Who knows? Exactly. Now? Wild time to be alive. Uh, love you, bro. Thanks for doing this. I'm sure we're going to talk a lot this year. Thanks, Elon. Thanks, everyone. This is some wild shit, man. Uh, take care, dudes. Love it. Thanks, Peter. In, ret in retrospect, it was inevitable. <laughs> yes, my brother. <laughs>